Hello, I'm Terry Brady. I'm a software developer with the California Digital Library. And I'm gonna to talk to you about how I constructed a repository test strategy for my team that was built on Docker containers. So I and the team I work on work with work for a library. That means we work with librarians and archivists. We build software uh, tailored to address their unique needs. And our software projects are informed by library science standards and best practices. And one of those standards is to focus on digital preservation of content that a library owns. And a digital preservation repository is really focused on decades long accessibility of content, not just data backups for day to day, but, but really thinking about long term continuity of access to information. In a digital preservation repository, objects or logical objects are deposited into the repository for preservation. And these logical objects consist of one or more digital files and metadata that describe those digital files. So the system that uh, I and my team work on is called Merit, and it is a digital preservation system for the University of California. We house uh, co digital content from the 10 University of California campuses. We're the backend repository for the Dryad service, which hosts uh, published data sets from over 2000 institutions Merit also houses uh, the archives of 85 journals published by the California Digital Library. So we run a production environment that hosts 170 terabytes of unique content. And then we have that content uh, replicated in three copies spread around the United States. We make use of three different storage providers to house each of those copies. The repository contains 2.3 million logical objects which consists of 55 million unique files. The Merit service is uh, composed of eight microservices that run on 23 servers. Uh, you'll note we're not yet running as containers. In our stage environment, this is our certification environment, also our integration test environment for testing Merit with other applications. Um, in this environment, we have 24 terabytes of unique content we also make use of the same three cloud storage providers. The stage environment has 60,000 objects, 2 million unique files. It also comprises eight microservices running on 17 servers. What we don't have is a formal development environment. So this environment was discontinued before I joined the team. And that's kind of at the heart of this presentation. I want to talk about how I designed a Docker-based solution to sort of fill in the gap uh, for that missing development environment. So what happened to our development environment? Well, it turned out uh, keeping, you know, with a relatively small team, keeping production servers and stage servers and development servers patched and running, as well as curating meaningful test, test data for a development environment were complicated for a team of our size. So uh, just to set a context, the Merit team uh, is comprised of one product manager, three developers, of which I'm one. And then uh, we share uh, time, the time of a DevOps engineer with other teams in our department. I joined the team in late 2019 as the technical lead for the Merit system. So in really in joining the team, my first priority was to build a development environment so that I could safely modify code. That was my first objective. And Docker turned out to be my solution. Uh, it, it helped me meet that objective. I, I was able to build a development environment that I was comfortable working in, but it also came with some other benefits. And after I share with you the design of uh, what was built, I'll talk about some of those additional benefits. So I wanna give you just a quick and simplified tour of the Merit system to kind of lay the, the framework for what I'll be talking about. So our, the Merit system um, has a MySQL database at its heart. We call this our inventory database, and that tracks metadata about the objects that we're managing in the repository. We have a user interface that lets users browse the contents of the repository. Also, when new content needs to be deposited, the user interface uh, submits content to our ingest microservice. This service uh, queues up tasks into a Zookeeper queue and then pulls tasks off of that queue to process new content for ingest. Um, content is sent to our storage microservice to be 
uh, save to cloud storage. And the storage microservice uh, picks a primary node for the content, and that primary node could be uh, living in Amazon S3, uh, Cumulo storage at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, or in Wasabi storage. So we, we save one uh, primary copy of the content. Um, after that saving of content is complete, we uh, put a task on another Zookeeper queue, which is picked up by our inventory microservice, that inventory microservice records the location of the content back to the inventory database. So once we know the location of the content in cloud storage, the user interface, in addition to displaying metadata, is able to provide the user with download links to download the content directly from cloud storage. We make use of the pre-signed URL uh, capability from each of our cloud providers that allows a uh, user to download large files uh, directly out of cloud storage. And this uh, function is served up by a specialized version of our storage microservice that we call our access microservice. So uh, content then is after the primary node has been saved, we replicate content to two additional copies. And when we replicate content, in addition to Amazon S3, we also run um, Amazon Glacier as one of those possible replication locations. And then uh, we continually uh, check the integrity of the content in the repository by performing checksum calculations on the content in cloud storage. And we record those results and verify those results against our inventory database. For simplicity, I'm going to talk about what, what I kind of consider our core microservices, the first uh, several that I introduced to you. And what we'll do is I want to talk about how I took this uh, workflow of core microservices and um, assembled them as a Docker stack for testing purposes. So how, how did I build this development environment? Well, the first thing I did was I created a Docker Compose file and uh, created a Merit Docker network inside of the Docker Compose file. Uh, for the inventory database, uh, we built a Docker image uh, using a MySQL 5.7 Docker image, and we loaded the Merit schema into that uh, image on initialization. Next, for our user interface, we built a Docker image using a Ruby 2.6 Docker image, and that, that then satisfied the uh, needs of our user interface. We also uh, modified or overlaid several of the configuration files for the user interface to help that microservice locate other microservices all within the Docker network itself. For our access, um, I'm sorry, for our storage ingest and inventory microservices, those are all Java-based. They're actually Tomcat um, applications. So we built uh, Docker images for those services using a Tomcat 8 Docker image. And as I did with the user interface, I built, I overlaid configuration files into those uh, containers to help each of those services find other services purely within the Docker network. For Zookeeper, we uh, built a customized um, Zookeeper image using the Zookeeper 3 Docker image. And lastly, this, this was particularly exciting to me. All of our, because all of our cloud storage solutions implement an S3 API, we found that there's a Minio Docker image that implements the S3 API entirely as a Docker container. So this, this was particularly exciting to me that you know, not only could I um, containerize my applications, but even the whole notion of cloud storage was able to be run as a container with all the flexibility that that provided. Uh, the last decision need, that I needed to make was to decide what do we need to persist? So when we you know, stop our stack of containers and then restart them later, what content do we want to preserve from run to run? And we determined that uh, the contents of the inventory database and the contents of the Minio storage uh, container were the things that we wanted to persist from run to run. And all of that uh, led to the creation of one great big Docker Compose file. And just I'll, I'll show you that briefly. At the end of my presentation, I'll have a link to the code repository where this exists if you're curious to take a closer look. You'll see um, here within 
this uh, file. I've got a merit network defined in the Docker Compose file. I have a volume for my database, a volume for the Minio container. So that volume has all of our cloud storage uh, for this Docker stack. Um, I've got here an ingest service, as I described, a storage service, as I described. And we could scroll through. There are many other um, images and containers that are defined here. In fact, there's there are more images and containers than I have uh, described here in the presentation, just for simplicity's sake. So in addition to creating that big Docker Compose file, I found a number of development tools that were particularly useful when in interacting with these containers. So I became a big fan of Visual Studio Code, especially with some of the Docker supporting extensions. There's a, a set of Docker extensions that were really useful. A remote editing um, extension that has has been incredible, and then to a lesser extent, I found the Java Debug and Ruby Debug extensions to be particularly useful. To make this stack of containers more portable for other members of my team, I also embedded um, inside of the uh, repos code repository for the Docker stack a settings.json file uh, for Visual Studio Code, and in this file, I um, included a bunch of pre-built recipes for uh, do, performing Docker Compose up and Docker Compose down. So that allows us to um, start and stop various combinations of services uh, within the stack. And we can start and stop, or we can start those with or without performing a rebuild. So that just has made the um, development and test cycles uh, much simpler. There's also a set of um, Docker exec recipes that I've embedded just to uh, provide quick access to common functions within the containers, like um, there's a, a Docker exec recipe to open up MySQL in a MySQL uh, client session with the credentials already provided to the MySQL client. So something uh, very useful for running quick tests of the content of the database. So I want to give you uh, just a, a super simple um, demonstration of this stack of containers. So for that, I'm going to pop over to VS Code. I'm running this on one of my servers. Um, I, uh, you'll see here I've got the uh, Docker extension already installed in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to navigate in my repository to the Docker Compose file. I'm going to indicate that I want to start up a stack of containers. And I've predefined a stack of containers um, in this DockerCon demo. Um, recipe. So this is bringing up a stack of containers and we can actually watch them uh, start up over on the container tab. Several of those containers are coming up. You know, and what, one really nice thing about running these containers in Docker is that in addition to having access to all the um, publicly uh, available um, interfaces within the system, uh, with Within Docker, I've exposed a ton of backend services as well for the system. So here I'm going to uh, navigate to my site. And what I have here is a predefined page that um, gives me access to my user interface, but also gives me access to different ports uh, within um, each of the different running containers. So I'm going to uh, pop into the user interface. And essentially what I've started up in the by running this DockerCon demo is an empty version of the Merit system. So I'm going to um, navigate to a particular collection, uh, a demo Merit collection. You'll see there's nothing in this collection right now. I want to indicate that I'm going to add an object. I'm going to choose a file to add. And uh, as, a, as the file that I'm adding, I downloaded an image from the DockerCon conference uh, website. So we'll pick that image. Um, I'm going to uh, call this uh, DockerCon uh, 2021 image. And we'll say that I'm the one who created this object. We'll submit it. And we receive confirmation that the content has been submitted. Going back to that uh, back end navigation page that I shared with you, 
I can actually um, navigate to a service that we've built to have a view of the content in the Zookeeper queue. So I'm going to navigate to this uh, administrative tool and just take a look at my queue of jobs. Uh, this is running. We'll see that um, DockerCon 2021 image, that's the, ob the title of the object we've submitted. This is telling me that the queue processing has already been submitted. So the um, object is probably well on its way to being loaded in the system. I will navigate back to the user interface. Go to my collection and you'll see that DockerCon image has uh, now appeared as an object in the system. Um, this we've got a um, unique identifier to uh, be able to cite and reference uh, this object. And if I click on the image, we will see the uh, DockerCon image from the conference website. Um, additionally, a thing that was uh, really kind of exciting to me was uh, the Minio container that I described to you um, comes with a nice browser that lets you browse the content of the cloud storage. So I'm going to navigate to the Minio service. And I need to uh, log in. And from here, I can actually browse and see the um, objects that have been saved into cloud storage, including our PNG file from the conference website. So now what I'm going to do is pop back to my Docker Compose file, make use of a predefined recipe to stop the stack that's running. So I'm going to stop the DockerCon demo, and that'll bring down uh, the containers one by one. And that'll allow me to return back to the presentation. So, uh, you know, I, I shared with you that Docker Compose file that defined the set of core microservices that we're running, the MySQL container, the user interface, the ingest inventory storage services, the Zookeeper queuing system, and Minio for cloud storage. But, you know, one of the things that I love about Docker Compose is the ability then to combine together multiple Docker Compose files and run interesting combinations of services. Uh, one challenge that I ran into was uh, with the way that we're making use of the retrieval directly from cloud storage, we needed to create URLs in the cloud provider, in the, the cloud storage container that were both um, accessible from inside the container and accessible from outside the container. And the way we, that we accomplished this was uh, when I'm running the stack of containers on my desktop, I have a local.yml file. And what this local.yml file does is it creates a hostname alias that alias is, that is alias to localhost. And that way, when I want to access content directly in cloud storage, I use the alias and the alias returns me a localhost link. When I'm running the stack of containers on one of our um, organization's servers, um, I have an ec2.yml because we, we're running on Amazon EC2. In that instance, um, in a, a very tiny little Docker Compose file, I provide a different alias, and that alias is uh, the public DNS of my server to the, this hostname alias. And that allows me to directly download content from the Minio container uh, when I'm running in that mode. So just I, I love the ability that without creating a whole lot of complexity, I can create slightly specialized versions of the stack of containers for different environments. Um, another challenge we ran into was, you know, I, I showed you this stack of um, containers running with a, a rel rel with an empty or with empty version of the repository or a repository with very little content. Sometimes when we're testing code, we need to test queries that uh, need to perform well. And in order to do that, we need to uh, run a database with lots and lots of content. And the solution that we came up with was to create a specialized uh, Docker Compose file that would ignore the MySQL um, configuration, the MySQL container that we defined in the main Docker Compose file. And instead, it provides a way to access the credentials for 
uh, what we call our development database, which is a, an old clone of our production database. So that has the millions and millions of records uh, in there that uh, is really useful when we need to performance test queries. So uh, starting these two Docker Compose files up together allows us to run the system in a mode where we can run uh, more complicated queries. Um, the, this setup of uh, Docker Compose files also gave us an opportunity um, to integration test with other services. So I described to you before that we run this, uh, the replic and audit, replication and audit services. So we don't often need to run those services for the majority of the development tests that we're running. But when we do, we have a separate Docker Compose file, audit replic.yml, and that defines two additional containers, again, built on Tomcat 8. And those run in combination with the core microservices, allowing us to run an even larger stack of services and test them together. Um, a thing that I, I found uh, pretty exciting and interesting was having the ability to uh, debug code, not just debug running code, but debug code running in context with other microservices. So what we found was uh, by making use of VS Code and some of the remote uh, debugging capabilities that were available, um, I was able to uh, define additional Docker Compose files to select a single microservice to um, do perform remote debugging against. So we've got a debug file for our user interface, which is Ruby-based, and a debug file for ingest, inventory, and storage applications, uh, each of which are Java-based applications. So it's really nice if I get a, get a good um, test scenario running inside of my stack to then be able to interactively debug any one of these microservices while uh, running through that scenario. And there are future ways that we hope to extend this stack of containers. Um, one thing I would love to do, so I described to you how we swap out the containerized database for a development database that we have when we want to run performance tests against um, MySQL. Similarly, I would love to swap out our Minio container for uh, real individual um, buckets of cloud storage at our three different providers. So what I'd like to do is make use of some development buckets that we have created with each of those providers and configure those to be swapped in in certain circumstances into this stack of containers. There are some, even though each of those uh, storage providers implements an S3 API, there are subtle differences between uh, the behavior of each storage provider, and it would be nice to be able to uh, really do fine-grained testing of that using this Docker stack. Uh, some other things that we would like to do are um, persist baseline integration tests as Docker volumes so that we could uh, reload those volumes over and over again and perform repeatable tests. So we've got, uh, after we built this stack of containers, we were able to build a really nice set of automated integration tests and those, but what those tests do is they rely entirely on always adding new content into the repository. So we don't have the sophistication yet of starting with a really rich baseline of content to uh, retrieve. We, we kind of always rely on adding new content uh, before we begin running tests. So there were several benefits that we got out of creating this uh, stack of containers. So, uh, you know, most importantly, uh, we, we satisfied the intended benefit of building this uh, environment. We created a development environment. It has allowed us to test each and every microservice in the stack. And then to our surprise, it also gave us this capability to remote debug each microservice. Uh, that, was, that was delightful to discover. Um, additionally, we ended up with a highly replicable environment. So, you know, each member of the team um, has access to run this stack on a different development server. Um, and so that's been really great. It's completely disposable. So part of the beauty of working with Docker is, you know, we can destroy all the containers and recreate them fast uh, or quickly. So it's fast to initialize, uh, rep easily replicable, and it supported our end-to-end -end testing. Um, 
And, you know, a nice thing, too, is it's been a great learning opportunity for the team just in, in working with a stack of containers. It's inspired each of my colleagues to go uh, build some specialized containers for some software that they wanted to test. And we got some unexpected benefits. So, so beyond just those technical benefits, we got, we got some, uh, some great learning benefits. So for me, as a new technical lead joining the system, I just can't think of a better way to learn the interconnectedness of a system than by uh, creating a stack of containers to uh, represent that system. It gave me a great high-level understanding of all the interactions between components, and it helped me to become conversant in each component of the system even before I had had the chance to really delve in and look at any of the code associated with those components. Um, another thing that was really nice was we found that we, as a team, we read through, we did a walkthrough of the Docker Compose file, um, and it just gave this really nice, brief declarative description of our system as a whole. And some long-term uh, time team members learned some new things about the way different components interacted just in that review process. So I think as, you know, in the future, if we have the chance to onboard new team members, I think you know this Docker Compose file is going to be a great place where we'll, you know, get started in teaching uh, somebody how all the pieces fit together. The um, another unexpected benefit was it you know just the the act and discipline of containerizing our microservices prompted some really useful um, enhancement ideas. So we had, when we deployed our code to uh, various servers, we had uh, some configuration files that were manually uh, created on each host separate from the code deployment process. Uh, that, that was just kind of the way things were done, but that doesn't work very nicely uh, when deploying code in a Docker stack. So we've, we have since, um, gone microservice by microservice, phased out those individually deployed configuration files, and created some more sophisticated YAML files to convey the, the same configuration details. And we now deploy those YAML files as code. So even though, you know, for the time being, we're still running our stage environment and our production environment as server-based applications, not as containers, We've already taken a step towards containerization. So, you know, maybe in the future we'll go that way. But in any case, sticking in a pure server environment, uh, this act already will simplify any auto scaling um, actions that we decide to take with those services. Um, it also prompted us to specialize our storage service uh, because it was uh, so easy to reconfigure the application. So now we have a dedicated instances of the storage service to satisfy user requests to access content and a separate set uh, version of the storage service to service the ingest process. So um, anyway, I hope you found this interesting. I'm sharing some links here for my GitHub profile, um, an overview page sort of describing the merit system as a whole, if you're curious. And then all of the Docker resources that I built as a part of this effort are in the merit Docker repository. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity.